unmuted. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar, GDPR, what does it mean for the public sector? My name's Louise Stokes and I'll be chairing today's session. Um, and I'll just go over the topic um, running you through before I hand over to our presenters today. So ensuring a high level of protection of personal data is the core intent of GDPR. Public sector organisations collect and process substantial amounts of personal data. This regulation demands significant changes in the way personal data is processed, thereby causing impact to the organisation's IT landscape. During this Digital Leaders webinar today, um, you will hear from experts including Jessica Shard, GDPR Certified Professional, and Sagar Gold, Solution Architect at Maztec. Our presenters will guide you through important aspects of the regulation, the impact for those aspects, and possible approaches towards compliance. A couple of guidelines before we start. Um, if everyone could please mute their microphone during the presentation to avoid any background noise. Um, and you can contact me or the Digital Leaders account through the chat box if you have any questions for our presenters. We will record this session today, which will include the audio and the slides, and we will email everyone after the session with a link to that recording and also connect you to our presenters today. So without further ado, I would, it's my pleasure to introduce our two presenters. We have Jessica Shah, who is the business architect and consultant with over 20 years of experience. She is a certified GDPR professional helping Maztec customers and prospects in their GDPR journey. She has worked with many NHS organizations on large data related initiatives and other public sector departments in the UK. She has also worked globally in many countries consulting with large financial services organisations. She helps customers assess their processes, data assets and IT systems for GDPR compliance, thus helping customers have initial quick wins whilst drafting long-term strategies for GDPR compliance. And we also are joined by Sagar Gold. He is a solution architect at Maztec with over 15 years of experience. Sagar specialises in building data management solutions and for the past year, he is helping customers in their GDPR journey. So without further ado, I will hand over to our presenters. Over. Thank you, Louise. Uh, good afternoon and welcome everyone to this uh, webinar on GDPR within the public sector. Both me and my colleague Sagar hope that this is a good use of your time and um, uh, this is a good session for everybody. Uh, Louise will no doubt uh, share all our contact details, but if you have any questions, queries, or would like any further conversations, please do get in touch with us. Thank you. So GDPR in, uh, in a nutshell, I don't think every, anyone here is new to GDPR, and I assume that most of us on the calls have had some uh, some somewhere related in the journey of GDPR have some knowledge and got some got some involvement either through their own organizations or through their customers or through their associations. And hence, I'm just going to have a very, very quick introduction on GDPR. The GDPR harmonizes data privacy laws across Europe and provides a single personal privacy law across all European member states. It aims to prevent security breaches and loss of personal data by organization. It also gives citizens control over their personal data. The regulation affects any organization that offers goods or services to consumers or any organization who monitors the behavior of the EU citizens. I think this is an important point because there has been a lot of conversation around who gets impacted. And I guess the regulation is very clear in terms of any organization dealing with EU citizens are impacted by the law and they need to comply with the regulation. The regulation has gone live on 25th of May 2018 and most of us have had a journey in that. Um... Right, moving on, let's just look at some of the important terms that we're going to be using in this presentation. Basically a GDPR parlance which you may have heard and we will use continuously through our journey. Personal data. Any information using which a natural person can be identified is personal data. Data controller, a person, public authority or body who determines the purposes and means of processing personal data is a data controller. 
Data processor, a person, public authority or body who processes personal data on behalf of the controller. Data subject, any living individual who's the subject of personal data. You, me, everyone in this room is a data subject. Supervisory authority, one or more independent public authorities responsible for monitoring the application, the applicable of the regulation. So ICU in this case is the supervisory authority and remains the same in, in most scenarios today. Moving further, there are a lot of challenges that uh, public sector organizations face because of the uh, regulation. And let's just talk through some of them. So the myth is that life will become difficult and day-to-day -day functioning for departments will become difficult because of the new regulation. Well, that's not true. Yes, it does bring several challenges, but it's more to ensure compliance with the law and keeping data of our citizens and patients and hence ourselves safe. Let's look at some of the challenges. Supply chain disruptions. When we share data between dif different departments within an organization or, or different departments within the public sector or between healthcare settings like primary care, secondary care or different trust within the NHS, the, the regulation wants us to look at some aspects just to make sure the data is secured. The question that it poses is, what are the clear demarcation between the duties and liabilities when you're sharing data across organization? When you're sharing data, what and what extent of the data are you sharing? And do you really need to share all the data that you're sharing? Who bears the liabilities and at what points? That's important. Who's the controller? Who's the processor? Is there any change of roles? Why, when and how? When the data is moving across organizations, where is it being stored? Are the systems that are storing compliant to GDPR? And are the processes through which the data is being shared and processed compliant to GDPR? Let's, take, let's look at an example. My GP collects my information on my health condition and on my conditions and ailments. This is required by the GP to get a better understanding of me as a whole so that he can treat me better. At this point in time, the GP is the controller and the processor. When I go to the GP with a particular condition and he needs to refer me to secondary care, the GP also shares my health record with all the relevant information to secondary care. At this point of time, they're handing over the control to the secondary care and the secondary care provider thus becomes the controller and also becomes a processor because they would update my health record in terms of the diagnostics, in terms of the treatments um, and other details that they would add to my record. When the treatment is complete or when the diagnostic is complete and when they share the results back to the GP, they once again hand back the control to the GP and the GP once again becomes the controller. So in, in that example, we're seeing how the roles get reversed and how data or information flows from different organizations. The next challenge is increased staff pressure. With GDPR, there are, a set, there are a set of new roles that come into play. Example, the DPO, the data, uh, the, uh, data controller, or a team of people that are required to actually process the requests that come from uh, different data subjects. This needs additional resources and hence there is a pressure on public sector organizations. Similarly, systems and processes need to go through audits. This also puts pressure in terms of both time and resources. The next challenge is systems. Systems that hold the process and data need to be audited for their compliance to GDPR. That's true for all existing systems. All in-flight systems, i.e. the systems and processes that are being built, or any new system or process that is being designed or architected. This overall means an in inevitable increase in cost, time, and resources. Similarly, organizations need to have a set of policies and standards for systems, for storage, for security, which again puts pressure on different resources. Let's look at another challenge, which is catering to the rights. Now, citizens now have several rights, and hence 
there can be a large volume of requests that can come into public sector organization to cater to these rights. The more personal the information, the greater the justification for disclosure and hence greater volume of requests. This poses the challenge of additional people, process and technology to respond to this request. Under the GDPR, healthcare providers need to inform the patient if they use the data for anything apart from uh, basic care or, or if they share the data with other organizations. This consent process also puts pressure on organizations in terms of uh, people, process and technology. The last challenge is around the minimization of data. Over the years, most of the departments have collected and gathered a lot of data which is being stored into their systems. The question here is, is all of that data needed? Is all of that data actually being used for the day-to-day -day processing? If not, there needs to be something done with that data. So this requires an audit of all data assets. And this is a big task. This needs tools, this needs people, this needs processes. So once again, it puts pressure on resources. GDPR states minimum amount of information that is necessary for the process should be obtained and should be stored. Moving further, there are some important aspects of GDPR and let's just quickly look at them. We will discuss some of the aspects which have significant impact, especially on public sector. As a public sector organization, you collect a lot of personal data and also collect special categories of data. The way this data is stored, processed and shared requires significant changes based on the new regulation. Most of the processing in the organization happens through automated means. In other words, the IT landscape is likely to be complex with many systems, communicating with each other and storing this data. This is one aspect where you would require to make a good investment to ensure compliance with the regulation. From a policies and rights perspective, we will discuss about uh, the appropriate rights and policies that public sector need to use and the usage of consent as necessary. What are some of the do's and don'ts when fulfilling data subject rights? We will also discuss some of the new responsibilities introduced by the regulation and what new roles would be required to carry out these responsibilities. And finally, we will see that all needs to be implemented in terms of data protection by design and the by design and default. So at the outset, we're thinking of protection of data when we think of any system, any process and any sharing of data. With that, I'd like to hand it over to Sagar to take the next few slides. Over to you, Sagar. Thank you, Jessica. Special categories of personal data was previously known as sensitive personal data in the Data Protection Act. Considering the sensitive nature of this data, special consideration is required when storing and processing it. A data breach in any of these categories might pose significant risk to the concerned person's fundamental rights and freedom. You may also have to inform the affected individual in this case. Out of the listed categories on this slide, most were present in the Data Protection Act. Biometric data and genetic data are two new categories which have been introduced by the GDPR. Interestingly, processing of photographs will not be considered as sensitive processing. Photographs will be covered only to the extent they allow the unique identification or authentication of an individual as a biometric. For example, if you are using an electronic passport, then it will fall in this category. One potential impact is that if you are processing any biometric data, then you will need to conduct a privacy impact assessment and implement measures to mitigate the risks arising out of such processing. If you are not in a position to implement such measures, then the GDPR requires you to consult a supervisory authority, which is the ICO in this case. Now that we understand the sensitivity of personal data, there are several precautions or do's and don'ts that are essential for public sector organizations. The first one is be clear on the basis of processing. So there are 10 conditions for processing special categories of personal data. We'll just go through a few of these. The first one is explicit consent of the data subject. 
the second is to necessary for carrying out obligations under employment or social security and the third one is to necessary to protect the vital interest of the data subject who is physically or legally incapable of giving consent and then there are others too so here the advice is that as far as possible you should not rely on consent for processing such data the next one is to introduce additional safeguards so personal data needs to be handled carefully to avoid any data breach and ensure security some of the possible ways are to process this data in a separate data store with added safeguards access to this data should be restricted and monitored using automated means ideally even dbas and system administrators should not have access to such data if you are storing this data on the cloud then remember that most of the cloud providers have a shared responsibility model the cloud provider is generally responsible for the security of the cloud whereas you are responsible for the security inside the cloud additionally you can also apply techniques like pseudonymization and encryption to protect such data the next is to check for further introduced conditions so gdpr grants rights to member states to impose further conditions for processing of certain categories of such data so if you are processing large amount of biometric data or genetic data or health data then it is advised that you pay special attention to any national developments in this area and the last one is consent so here again the advice is that as far as possible processing special categories of personal data using consent should be avoided because gdpr sets high standards for consent and some of these standards are that consent should be given freely the user should take an affirmative action and again the consent is withdrawable any time so if the data subject withdraws his consent then you might not be able to go ahead with the processing however in case if you are going to use this option then ensure that your consent acquiring mechanisms are in line with these prescribed standards you may also have to ensure that you have processes and systems in place to demonstrate that the acquired consent was in line with the prescribed gdpr standards moving on to data breaches a personal data breach is more than just about losing personal data so let us discuss some examples of what could constitute as a personal data breach one example would be that you face a network attack in which personal data related to patients or citizens is compromised one more example would be that while responding to a subject access request you sent across data to an incorrect email address so mr x has raised the subject access request but accidentally you sent across that data to mr y one more example would be that you have outsourced some of your personal data processing activities to a third party firm and someone in their organization unlawfully accesses such data a more common example would be that one of your executive loses his laptop during commute and it has files containing email addresses of patients or citizens and a last example would be that a ransom virus encrypts personal data on the system and makes it temporarily unavailable an important question to discuss immediately after you have detected the breach is that will the breach result in high risk to the rights and freedom of an individual for example if medical records are accidentally compromised by a hospital the answer to this question would likely be a yes in a separate situation an operator accidentally delete some records related to patient diagnosis but these records can be restored from the backup in such a case the individual is not at a high risk and need not be informed so in a scenario where you have ascertained that the concerned individual has to be informed then you should provide the name and contact details of your data protection officer inform inform him or her the likely consequences of the data breach and what you are doing to minimize any adverse impacts of the breach it would also be advisable that you inform the individual any measures he or she can take to protect themselves so let's look at some things that we can do for managing data breaches the first one is to have systems in place so according to one survey on an average it takes more than 6 months to identify a data breach a lot of damage can happen in this time 
you should provide regular training to staff, use breach detection tools, and make it easy for anyone across the organization to report a data breach. The next one is to build a team for responding to a data breach. Once you have detected a breach, there are many activities which will have to be conducted simultaneously, like determining whether the individual has to be informed, informing the supervisory authority, taking necessary steps to manage the breach, and others. Building a cross-functional team to respond to a data breach will certainly help. The data protection officer can head this team. The next one is put processes in place to notify the supervisory authority. So here, the ICO has published a breach notification form, which can be used to report the breach. Along with this form, you can attach additional documents. The next one is to define and communicate the escalation matrix. So as mentioned earlier, anyone in the organization can detect and report a breach. The employee should know to whom they should communicate, and in case he or she does not get a response, to whom can they escalate? The next is to create a standard format for reporting a data breach. So the ICO has again provided a format for a reporting a data breach, but in the context of your organization, you may want to capture more details so that you are in a position to respond better to the breach. For example, you might want to capture details again, what department did the breach occur, who first identified the breach and so on and so forth. The next is to record all breaches. You should have a log of all the breaches that happen in your organization. The IC also provides a template for the same. The next is to put process in place to notify the individuals. So this is the difficult part. Notifying the individuals may be your obligation, but there are other things you can do to help him. For example, if the password of an individual has been compromised and the individual is not digitally savvy, you can ask your IT team to assist him. And the last one is to run mock data breach incidents. So no matter how much preparation you put in managing data breaches, an actual breach may cause severe panic. Running mock data breaches will help the team better prepare for the situation. It would be even better if you don't inform the team that it is a mock. Now, Jessica will talk about data sharing. Jessica, I think you are still muted. Oh, sorry. Data is frequently shared across public sector and health organizations. This is sometimes part of the main process and is required to complete the process. And sometimes it's for the wider use and benefit. The process of sharing changes the roles and processes like I mentioned earlier, and sometimes even reverses the roles. Health organizations often share data both as part of the care episode and also for other purposes. Trusts normally use MOUs for sharing data which will now need to become more detailed and more complex in terms of changing changes in the liabilities and at what point the liabilities change, the impact of the breach should it occur, and at what point it occurs. A common outline of a framework agreement would help in accelerating the contracts for such exchange and related liabilities. GDPR empowers individuals with eight rights. Some of these are right to access and right to rectification, which will be widely used, we suspect. One important point to note here is that these rights are not absolute. They are conditions where, when they are applicable and exceptions when they are not applicable. In the upcoming slides, let's talk a bit about these rights and what, what they mean for the public sector. Subject access requests. A recent investigation conducted by Blue Source across 30 public sector organizations identified that less than a third had appointed dedicated staff or dedicated teams to deal with subject access requests, despite the risk of substantial fines under GDPR, should the organization be deemed in breach. So this just proves how important it is for public sector organizations to respond to these requests. With the GDPR offering several rights to citizens, including the right 
like to know what data and information is held about them. It could mean that suddenly there's an influx of a large volume of requests and there needs to be a team and tools and processes in place to actually deal with them. These requests could come through any channels. It could be either verbally, it could be in writing, it could be through electronic means. It can come from different kinds of citizens, whether it's digitally savvy citizens or digitally challenged citizens or, or citizens which have other challenges and problems. Ideally, we, it would be nice if all the requests would just go to a dedicated team who's trained to respond to these requests. But in real life, it can happen that these kind of requests go to different employees or as part of a process. This in turn means that the training is required for wider teams and wider employees, not just the team that is dedicated to respond to such requests. Whilst receiving these requests, there is obviously the need to verify the identity of the person requesting the information. Otherwise, there might be a slight chance that personal information may be provided to somebody else, and that obviously breaches data and defeats the whole purpose of privacy. This requires system process training and potentially even an entire uh, request processing cycle or a case management process might become necessary. Once identified, it's clarified that the request is serviceable, then there needs to be checks around fees and whether, we, whether you can respond or not. The key is to go back to this data subject and uh, communicate what is the next step and uh, what is going to happen to the request. The final and the most important aspect is actually gathering the data and the information to respond to the request. This could actually mean scouting various systems, databases, files, and even physical records. Once gathered, the information then needs to be processed to respond to the request because you need to respond in simple language that can be understood by the citizen. Thus, the overall process for SAR or a subject access request can become a burden on organization and they need to put processes, people and technology in place to respond to them. Whilst looking at subject access requests, a few aspects become very important, especially for public sector organizations. One of them is ethical behavior. The expectation is that public sector departments behave ethically when responding to any subject access request from a citizen. By responding to the subject access request in a reasonable time and in simple and clear language, departments can set a good example and gain citizen trust. The communication once again becomes a key here. Your decision to either fulfill the request, refuse the request, charge a fee or extend the timelines needs to be communicated clearly to the individual who's requesting the information. Good citizen experience. GDPR advises to build a secured and a self-service system to enable individuals access their information. Now, putting such systems in place not just benefits individuals or citizens, but in turn also reduces workload for the departments. However, as we discussed earlier, we need to take care of both digitally savvy, digitally challenged individuals and hence have mechanisms to deal with both. Another important aspect that the information should be provided in plain and simple language. So when extracting information from different systems and processes and different files, we need to then process to make sure there are no cryptic codes and the language is easy for an average citizen to comprehend. The timelines given by the ICO is to respond within a month and any delay outside of the month should be communicated to the citizen. The clock actually starts ticking the day after you receive the request. But in any case, if you ask for further information or if you want to charge any fees and you're and you're waiting for the response from the individual, then your clock actually starts after you've received that information. There are certain expectations for the data processor because sometimes you might actually be requesting data from different processors to respond to the subject access request. It would be good if there are clear expectations set between the data controller, which is the department itself, and the data processors, which might be within the organization or outside, to ensure that the correct information, all the information is received within the required timelines. 
Once again, let's talk about fees. There are there are instances where you could charge some fees, and that could be if the request is found to be uh, a repeat request, it's found to be unfounded or excessive, or if the individual is requesting additional copies of the same data again. You can then charge a fee, but the only caveat I see of states is let the individual know what fee you're charging and why, and get the approval from them. In some cases, you can even refuse to fulfill some requests. If you plan to refuse any such request, then once again, communication becomes key. Let the individual know you're refusing the request and why you're refusing the request. And also let him know that him or her know that he has a right to complain to the supervisory authority. Whilst sharing data outside of normal purpose, they require there, there is a need to have a consent from the individual. As an example, health data that is captured during a hospital spell, when used as part of the diagnosis and treatment, is within the purpose and hence needs no consent. But if that same data is shared with other parts of NHS or other parts of other organizations, maybe for research or maybe for other uh, processes, maybe like building tariffs or uh, using for uh, MIS or for operational reports or for comparison between organizations, then there needs to be a consent from the individual that you're using his or her data. Citizens and actually health bodies acknowledge the need for consent and are taking a step further to have a consent at granular level. As an example, the consent can be at levels, not just at an overarching level to say, yes, you can share my personal data and what you cannot share, but there could be consent at the next level to say, I'm happy for you to share my demographic data, but not my sexual orientation. I'm happy to share some of my treatments and conditions, but I'm not happy for you to share a particular treatment or a particular condition that I had in the past. A lot of organizations within the NHS are actually running programs to gather consent at different levels so that they can behave ethically. Similarly, personal health records are capturing consent from patients as part of their initial uh, data capturing and through the process. Thus, consent is becoming very, very important, especially in the health domain. Similarly, if you look at questionnaires or surveys, and when we conduct such a survey or a feedback to gather data, there needs to be consent in terms of what you will be using the data for and with whom. Let's take an example. If a library takes a, a survey or conducts a survey to find out areas in which they could improve, a simple example, they plan, they, they send a simple questionnaire, but they need to let the members of the library know what data they're capturing and what are they going to use that data for and are they going to be sharing that with anyone else. The members of the library have full rights to not respond or full rights to say not use my data or share my data with other organization. This is a valid case of consent. Similarly, when we look at apps or softwares that we install on our computers and on our mobile phones, there needs to be consent in terms of using the data that's collected as part of the apps or software. For example, when I install a health app, the data that is collected on a daily basis is meant to be used as a record keeping within the health app for me. But if the organization that built the app wants to use the data either for segmentation, for research, for marketing, or share it with other organization, then there needs to be a, a consent from me to use that data. Similarly, cookies or online tracking, uh, tracking trace my digital steps and also gather data being entered on the site. Once again, this needs explicit consent from the person before the data can be used anywhere else. Do you want to I'll hand it over to Sagar to go further? Over to you, Sagar. Yeah, thank you. So uh, let us look at the right to rectification and uh, what are some things that can be done. Uh, 
by organizations to manage this, right? So the first one is determine whether the data is indeed in their care. So in some cases, this might be a straightforward activity, but in some other cases, determining whether the data is indeed inaccurate might be difficult. So let's take an example here. Say a GP has diagnosed an individual with a particular condition, but further investigations prove that it is a different condition. In such a case, a patient might want the initial diagnosis to be rectified. But this cannot be done since both the initial diagnosis and the subsequent findings will have to be stored. In this case, the data that has been recorded is accurate, even though the initial diagnosis was not very accurate. The next is restrict processing of specific personal data attributes. So once you receive a request for rectification, it is recommended that you restrict the processing of those data elements until you have verified the accuracy. The next is to refuse to comply if the data is accurate. So just like in the previous example we discussed, once you have verified and confirmed that the data is accurate, you can refuse to comply with the request. But while doing this, clearly communicate the reason why you are not complying with the request. The next one is respond within one month. Here, the same rules apply, which we discussed during the subject access request. The fifth one is communicate rectifications to other recipients. So if you have shared the concerned personal data elements with other third parties or other departments, then you need to communicate these changes with them too. And the last one is to comply requests made through all means. So requests made through digital channels or other channels will have to be complied. Moving on to system updates. To comply with the GDPR, your IT systems will have to undergo major changes. Let us look at some aspects which are likely to require a change. The first one is data minimization. This requires an audit of processes, systems, and data assets. After conducting these audits, you may identify elements of data which you are capturing but are not required. You may have to alter the business processes to stop capturing non-essential data elements and update these systems. Even after changing the processes and systems, data may be present in historical records for such items and you will have to deal with those records. You may also want to look into your archival duration and practices. The next one is to cater to individual rights. As we have seen, GDPR provides individuals with various rights and it is highly likely that they would exercise those. It would be beneficial for everyone if you have systems in place to receive such requests. You'll also have to build tools like data extraction routines, data transmission routines to process such requests. The next is to enhance security. So it is highly likely that your IT landscape is complex and comprises of several different systems. To ensure that personal data is accessed only by authorized individuals, you may have to revisit your identity and access management system. And if possible, have a unified identity and access management system. You may also want to introduce special safeguards for your sensitive personal data so that even system administrators and database administrators are not able to access it. The next one is refine best practices. So here, you may have to review and refine your coding standards for logging data. You may also want to revisit the duration for which you maintain your website logs. And you may also want to modify your systems so that all access to personal data is recorded. And the last one is pseudonymization and encryption. So pseudonymization is the separation of data from direct identifiers so that linkage to an identity is not possible without additional information, and that additional information is to be held separately. Encryption is the process of encoding data in such a way that only authorized parties can access it. So let's take an example where you may be transmitting a file containing personal data to a data processor. So implementing file encryption in this case will reduce the risk of a data breach. Now let us take a look at the data protection by design and default. The guidance is here to make protection and security of data an inherent feature of any system to avoid breach as much as possible. Basically, if you build it right, you're protecting from day one. Data protection by design essentially implies factoring data protection right from the very early stages and throughout the life cycle. It is applicable whenever you're developing any new services or software 
or business practices. Data protection by default means that you only process data which is absolutely necessary to accomplish a specific purpose. So let us look at some steps that we can take. The first is data minimization. By this principle, the focus of data processing shifts from what data is useful to what data is necessary. While collecting personal data, you will have to be sure that all the personal data elements are required for achieving the purpose. The next is pseudonymization. So pseudonymization is a technique using which personal data can be altered in such a way that it cannot be attributed to the original one without using additional information. Here, please note that pseudonymous data is not exempt from the regulation. The third is to revisit standards. So while developing any new software, usually functionality and performance take precedence over security. With GDPR, this has to change. Data production by design mandates that security aspects are given equal weightage right from the very early stage of the project. You may again have to revisit your coding standards and logging practices and review how you share personal data. Here it is recommended that you use approved tools and frameworks and also usage of static code analyzers is recommended. The next is to set privacy settings to maximum. So it is advised that you should set the highest level of privacy for any new system or application. So let's take an example here. If you're using a website and your website is using cookies, then by default, your setting should be to only use those cookies which are essential for running the website. The user should be able to choose if he wants to enable the rest of the cookies. The next one is to provide tools to the users for reviewing and modifying the privacy settings. So one more example would be if an app by default should not track a user's location. However, if the user chooses, then he should be able to enable this feature. And the last one is to improve security features. Having security audits on systems is a good way to ensure that the principle of data protection by design and default is being implemented. Further, it is recommended that testing should include penetrative testing and vulnerability analysis. On this slide, we have listed all the IT solutions which may be required for complying with the regulation. So data discovery helps in facilitating individual rights and consent requirements by locating personally identifiable data across the IT landscape. Fine-grained access control strengthens data security and facilitates consent-based processing. Data Hub aids in fulfilling various customer rights. Data extraction, transmission, and erasure enable data portability and the right to erasure. The GDPR dashboard assists in demonstrating consent and recording and reporting data breaches. Pseudonymization and encryption enhance data security and lay the foundation for data protection by design and default. The data subject portal enables data subjects to exercise their rights and provide their consent. And a single view of the data subject helps in fulfilling the right to rectification requirements. Though complying to the regulation is mandatory, if done in the right manner, it can result in a number of benefits. The first one is cost savings. So as a first step of a compliance journey, you would be performing data discovery. And as a part of this process, organizations should identify obsolete and redundant data and get rid of it. By doing this, they will save on storage and even maintenance costs. Coming to the next one, it is scalability. To achieve compliance, organizations will have to consolidate fragmented data and integrate disconnected systems. This will subsequently help the organization's IT to scale. Individuals' trust towards organizations will increase once they know that their data is in safe hands and organizations are taking strong measures to prevent data breaches. And the last one is insights. So building a single view of the individual and being able to effectively and securely reference it allows the organization to tap into insights and run the organization more effectively. Using such data can help organizations provide more relevant services to individuals. Ever since the first draft of the regulation came out, there has been a lot of discussion on fines. This is mostly because focusing on fines makes big headlines. The intent of the regulation is to strengthen data protection by providing more levers to the citizens. And the ICO has 
clarified that the fines will be the last resort. So if you are not fully compliant yet, stop focusing on the adverse consequences of non-compliance and instead focus on steps that could take you towards compliance. Wonderful. Thanks, Sega, and thanks, Jessica. Uh, we will share that link also in the wrap-up email, but we do have a few minutes now uh, for some questions, so do send them through the chat box if you have any for Jessica and Saga. I've got a couple that I've received through, so we might get started. Um, the first one is um, about internal sites, so will GDPR apply to my internal sites? Okay, uh, I, I'll take that question. Uh, so, uh, I, yeah, the answer to that question would be a yes, uh, because GDPR applies to all personal data. Uh, it is as much about employee data as it is about individual data. So, it does not GDPR does not distinguish between employee data or uh, individual data. So, the answer to that question would be yes. It will also apply to your uh, internal sites. Okay, excellent. Um, and uh, in terms of those SAR, so those subject access requests, I th think I've got that acronym right. Um, what can a data subject ask through them, through the SAR? Jessica, Jessica would, you want, would you want to take that answer? Oh, sorry, I was... I was on mute, sorry. Yeah, I'll take that. Um, so through a subject access request, a data subject has the right to obtain the following uh, information. It could be the information that you're processing his or her data. They could ask for a copy of their personal data and any supplementary information. This could also mean around what additional data have you captured and why, and you know more around the privacy in addition, they could ask details like the purpose of your processing, why you're processing the data, the categories of the personal data that are concerned, the recipients or the categories of recipient you disclose to the personal data. It could also be the retention period. How long are you retaining my data? Where are you storing? How and why are you storing it for that long? The, there, there also can be requests for rectification, erasure, or uh, forgotten and restriction or to object some of the processing. There are rights that they can uh, lodge a complaint with the ICO if they think that some of the data that is being processed is not uh, in with their consent or if they think it is beyond the normal process. So there are several things that you can ask as part of the subject access request and uh, uh, the ICO has certain forms that you could use. So it gives several rights to the data subject whereby they can ask details in terms of what you hold for me, why, when, how long, and what are you going to do with it. Thank you. Okay, excellent. Um, and as I mentioned before, this session was recorded, so we will send the recording and also connect you directly with Jessica and Sagar if you have any further follow-on questions. Um, another question's come through. So does, does GDPR mandate implementing encryption or pseudomization? Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll take that. So uh, the answer to that would be uh, no, GDPR does not mandate uh, implementing encryption or pseudonymization. Uh, but GDPR suggests that these techniques are good options to strengthen data security and even avoid potential data breaches. So implementing one or both of these techniques uh, would put you in a better position to demonstrate compliance. However, nowhere in GDPR, it is mentioned that you will have to implement these, te these techniques. So, so, so the answer would be that no, it is not mandatory, but if you do it, then you are in a better position to demonstrate compliance. Okay, excellent. Um, just a question in relation to consent. So it was suggested that consent is not the best advisable option um, for processing special categories of personal data for public sector organisations. Um, but just in terms of health, is this true for health as well? 
I'll take that one. So like the Data Protection Act, uh, under GDPR, organizations that are processing health data must have a lawful basis of processing the data. When we, when we talk of health work, there is most likely to be a, an explicit consent needed from data subjects when you're using data apart from uh, regular processing. Health organizations can collect and use personal data without consent if it is used for the purpose of preventative care or actual care provision for treatment or under a contract with a health professional or another person subject to the professional secrecy law. Additionally, consent is not required if the processing is necessary for public health reasons or in some cases, if the organization can argue that the processing is necessary for scientific research and hence good for society in general. If you think as an organization that, that any of these grounds apply to your organization, then the best would be to discuss it with legal advisors, how you will approach the consent issue and only go on to the consent issue when it's applicable. If, if at all the data is not being used for any other purpose apart from advised care, then consent is not needed because it's part of the overall care. Thank okay, you. excellent. Thank you very much for the explanation of that. Um, we're just about out of time, but as I mentioned, we will send the link to the recording um, by email later this afternoon and connect you with Jessica and Saga. Thank you so much to our presenters for a really informative session today. Um, and thank you all for joining in. Um, if you haven't checked out the rest of the events happening this week on Digital Leaders Week, um, you can go to digileaders.com forward slash week and there's plenty of activity on there and also on Twitter using hashtag DLWeek and hashtag DigiLeaders. Thank you very much for joining and thank you again to our presenters. Goodbye. Thank you.